David, I'm going to be in the front. You can give me a sorry. What's up? I'm really sorry for bumping into you. No, no worries. I don't it's think we're going to just yet. Um, I just want to know, if I go on down those aisles, will I be seen? Robert Beta said just keep it on the speaker. And okay. then when I guess the video plays, that's when I'll zoom out. Yeah, but I don't think. Can I see what the zoom out looks like? Okay. Is it live now? I don't. It might be. I don't see what the, the widest frame looks like. Hold on a sec. Let me make sure it's not live because Robert Beta said he didn't want to show any empty seats. Uh, okay. All right, one sec. I'll be right back. Right, but hmm? well, only when the video is playing, that's when I'll be zoomed out for you.
David, you want me to call people in? Just they should be aware that the students of the yeshiva are watching live in their classrooms. And uh, we know that they're very much part of everything that's happening here um, in this very special uh, venue. It seems very surreal to be here um, at the Levaya of Mori Chami, Rav Yisrael David Ben Yaakov Yitzchak, Rabbi Dr. David Eliach, his patira is really a kriya she'enu misacha. It's an irrevocable tear, an irreparable loss. Even though he was a very advanced age and very recently in failing health, and this moment was not completely unanticipated, such as the nature of the loss of an irreplaceable very special individual, a person who spans generations and who impacts generations. Even if you anticipate and even if you're not surprised, the sense of pain and loss is no less diminished. Mori Khami, Rabbi Dr. David Eliach, 
expressed his explicit wishes that the Levaya be here in Yeshiva of Flatbush. He was so proud of this institution. He really perceived it as an extension of his own family, his sense of devotion, commitment, and identification with it was truly a remarkable thing. The relationship between an individual and institution is a fascinating question, but I've almost never seen that degree of identification um, as Rabbi Eliyah had with this institution. He was the Ruach HaChayim behind this yeshiva and its development, its moraderech, even as such, even its shliach tzibur on Yamun Naraim, something which our family had the privilege of experiencing for many, many years. And therefore, that decades relationship and that impact, you know, which continues by definition, makes this indeed the appropriate place. But of course, he was not merely the principal, the Rosh Yeshiva of this yeshiva and this community, but his impact throughout as the mechanech par excellence of our generation was indelible and wide and deep. In many ways, he changed the landscape of Jewish education and therefore of religious commitment in this country and beyond. So even as we're here in Yeshiva of Flatbush, the reverberations and the loss is something that is felt throughout the Jewish community. And of course, the other no less significant concentric circle, and that is our family, where he was central, powerful force, a bigger than life presence, together with the unforgettable Professor Yaffa Eliach, who of course, they combined to be such a remarkable you know, force in the Jewish community, but especially in our family. Uh, he knew of Chano Naro Pidarko, he knew how to relate to each of his children and grandchildren, um, and therefore, on that level as well, we come gathered together to share some memories of his loss. We're going to proceed by beginning with the saying of Tehillim. Um, we're going to start with the two grandchildren, um, Ayalon Eliach, the oldest of the American grandchildren, and then Ariel Rosenzweig, Rabbi Ariel Rosenzweig, the oldest of the Rosenzweig um, branch of the American <laughs> grandchildren. My father-in-law had extraordinary relationships with all of his grandchildren. As I say, he knew each one and related to each one differently. In that sense, as we'll discuss, he was the consummate mechanic. But he really derived tremendous nachas from each and every one of them and I can think of no better representatives than I alone, whose relationship with him was very deep and very consistent, and Ariel, who again, was always involved with him, always learning, talking with him, and we're gonna have them say pure K to him um, to begin. David <laughs> Adonai menat chalki vekosi, ata tomich gorali. Chavalim nafubi banimim, av nachalat shafra alai. Abarech et Adonai, asher yatsan, av leilot yisruni chiliotai. Shviti Adonai vimegdi tamid, kimimini bal emot. Lachem, samach libi, viagel kvodi. אף בשרי ישכון לבטח, כי לא תעזוב נפשי לשאול, לא תיתן חסידך לראות שחת, תודייני אורח חיים, סוב השמחות פנחה, נעימות במנחה נצח.
Rabbi Eliyach was involved in so many different communities, and of course, also in the communities of his of his children. So we would like to ask um, to come forward some of the Rabbanim, representing, of course, all the others, myriads of them, with whom he interacted and had impact. I'd like to ask Rabbi Babbage of the Fifth Avenue Synagogue, who also just was an extraordinary help to us uh, last night in making arrangements, and who's very, very uh, connected with and supportive of my father-in-law, to be followed by Rabbi Arya Sokolov of Kigarden Synagogue, again, who spent a lot of time when he visited our home and had a great deal of regard for. And then we're going to ask Rabbi Ari Berman, representing president of Yeshiva University, representing the Yeshiva. My father-in-law taught for many years in graduate school, in Israeli, and really set the tone there and had great uh, regard and deep connections to the yeshiva. So we'd like to ask the three of them to come forward. Ms. Mola David, Adonai Roi, Lo Echzar. Inos Desha Yabitseni, Namatsiach <laughs> Which <laughs> Hey, ma, karuvan afalu, banachnu kamnu banisodod, adeno yoshio, amelach yaneinu viyom kareinu. Shabbat 
אותי רמי פחד לילה מחץ ואוף יומם. ידבר באופל יהלוך מכתב יחשו צהריים. ופה מצדך אלף רבבה ממינך אליך לא יגש. רק בעיניך תביט שאומת רשעים תראה. כי אתה אדוני מחסיא, אביון שמת מעונך. לא תונה עליך רעה ונגל לא יקרב עליך. כי מהלכה ביצע מלאך לשמרך בכל דרכיך. על כפיים יישאונך פנטיגות באבן רגליך. על שחר ותתן תדרוך תרמוס כפיר בתענין. כי בי חשך ואף על תהו. עסק בהו כי ידע שמי. יקראיני ועיניהו עמו אנוכי בצרה. אכל צאו ואכבדהו. אורך יום המשביעים. וראהו בשומתי. My father-in-law was Zohar to fulfill the tzivui of the Shinantam Levanecha throughout his whole life in an extraordinarily maximalist way. And that always begins with what he would have called Pshuto Shel Pshat, the Shinantam Levanecha, to teach your children. Baruch Hashem, he was Zohar. All three of his children, Rabbi Benzion Shapiro, Beretz Yisrael, Rabbi Yotav Eliach, Principal of Rambam, Professor Smadar, Rosenzweig, Professor Stern College of Tanakh, that each and every one of them was a real Talmud, maybe his best Talmud. And from that point of view, alone, his life is a tremendous success. We're now going to hear Divrei Hesped, first from Rabbi Yotav Eliach, who I guess is speaking from Eretz Yisrael. Rabbi Eliach, Rabbi Yotav Eliach, really pioneered so many programs, teaching Zionism, Abbas Eretz Yisrael, things that he learned that his father and his mother's foot from the very earliest and youngest of age. Zineritz is all right now and is going to be speaking to us through Link. It will be followed by Professor Smadar Rosenzweig, who really learned you know, from both of her parents and had a lifelong, intense learning, Tanakh, values, relationship. And also, as Yotav was, a wonderful son, Smadar, a wonderful, devoted daughter, who will be hearing from them. לדבר לכם היום מגוש עציון. ראשית, עליי להודות לאחותי, פרופסור סמדה רוזנצוויג, שלימדה אותי ואת כל משפחתי מה זה קיום המצווה של כיבוד אב. שנית, עליי להודות לברניס שעזרה לאבי מאז 2016, בחודשים האחרונים ממש טיפלה בו במסירות. אנחנו פה לתת כבוד לאבי הרב דוד אליאך זצר, יהודי מיוחד, יוצא דופן. הוא היה מעורב בחינוך יהודי ל-79 שנים. זה מספר לא יאומן, מספר שקשה לתפוס, מספר שקשה לעכל. הרב דוקטור דוד אליאך זצר, אבי, שינה את המפה החינוכית הדתית בגלות, לא רק בארצות הברית, אלא בכל הגלות. כרגע, אלפי תלמידים שלו יושבים וגרים בארץ, בארץ אבותינו, מדינת ישראל, למרבה בגללו. עשרות אלפי מתלמידיו חיים חיים מלא תוכן יהודי וציוני בכל העולם, למרבה בגללו. נפתחו עשרות ישיבות תיכוניות בארצות הברית, וגם עשרות ישיבות גבוהות ומכללות במדינת ישראל, למרבה בגללו. 
כל המערכת החינוכית, הציונית, הדתית, של ישיבות בני עקיבא וישיבות ההסדר שקיימים במדינת ישראל, למרבה קיימים בגללו וחבריו. מאות מנהיגים יהודים בגלות ובמדינת ישראל למדו איך להיות מנהיג ואיך להיות מנהיג יהודי מאבי זצ"ל. העקרונות שאבי זצ"ל האמין בהם תורת ישראל, עם ישראל ומדינת ישראל. לפי הם פעל כמורה, מחנך, רב, פרופסור, מנהל, אבא, סבא וסבא רב. ממשיכים להשפיע היום ומחר על עשרות אלפי יהודים צעירים ומבוגרים בגלות במדינת ישראל. התשומות של אבי זצ"ל לעם היהודי הן איתנו יום יום וממשיכים וימשיכו בעזרת השם אף על פי שהוא פיזי לא נמצא איתנו עכשיו. בעצם אני לא רק מספיד את אבי כי ההספד זה על מה שהבן אדם עשה בעבר. אני מספר לכם על התשומות של אבי זצ"ל שהיו וקיימים היום, ובעזרת השם ימשיכו בעתיד בקרוב והרחוק להתקיים. מלבד הדמות הענקית שאבי היה לעם היהודי, הוא גם כן היה דמות ענקית כאבא, סבא וסבא רבא. הוא היה אדם מלא חן, חסד, רחמים, הומור, חוכמה, אהבה, בינה. דעה והמון סיפורים. אדם שאהב את העולם מסביבו, אנשים וטבע, מוזיקה, ספרות, העולם שהבורא נתן לנו. אני וסמדר וילדינו לימדנו ואימצנו את התכונות האלו של אבי זצר. בעזרת השם נוכל ליהנות יותר מהחיים שלנו ומהעולם מסביבנו. שברא בורא העולם בגלל מה שלמדנו מאבינו הרב דוקטור דוד אליאב זצ"ל תהא נשמתו צרורה בצרור החיים celebrated his 99th birthday a little over a month ago. Yet, when I think of my father, what comes to mind is eternal youthfulness, his engagement with all ages, especially the young, his twinkling blue eyes, his openness to new ideas, his vibrancy, his ability to be mechadesh, to be creative on the spot. He wants you to quote the Pasuk, and he wants you to know if you understand Shut or Shulpshat. No matter what you answered, you did not have the right answer, because he always had the right answer. He understood the Pshat better. He's always youthful and optimistic. He is looking ahead to the future, towards the next project, always looking ahead to the next project. And he's always ready to give constructive criticism. I don't know if you know this, but he was a great storyteller, continental gentleman. He was mixed with Litvish and Hasidish soul. He was a wonderful shliach tzibor, and he loved to sing. He was a great cook. We called him Rav Cook. <laughs> Double entendre, of course. He was a great raconteur. He loved big ideas. And he was larger than life. He was in the midst of working on his Chidushim of Torah when he passed away, which he termed Shuto Shel Pshat. And again, only he understood Shuto Shel Pshat. When he asked you, what does this Pasuk mean? And we would give all the different Mepharshim or give our own ideas, but he really had the real intention of Shuto Shel Pshat. So wait 
to see the volume that's going to come in. He loved Torah and the words of the Torah. So on the one hand, he was completely youthful, thinking ahead. On the other hand, my father had wisdom and the experience of a fully lived 99 years. He had a unique perspective which melded all the diverse experiences in his life. Old World, Yerushalayim, Israel, and New York. Our children, his grandchildren, are also struck by this amazing fusion of youth and age. To us and everyone who knew him, he was ageless, and we are all tremendously saddened by his loss. Even though he was 99, he epitomized to us vigor and simchat chayim. On simchat Torah, just a day before he was niftar, I was davening with him and singing the nikunim of the hakafot, reading Kriyat Torah, Simchat Torah, and we ended with the words, Moshe ben Me'ave Swim Shana Bimoto, Lo Chahata Ino Benola Lonas Lecho, Vayit Kugle Israel Moshe, Ba'avot Mo'av Shloshi Yom, Vayit Mu Yemezachi Eber Moshe. Yoshua Binun Malevu Chokma Kisamach Moshe Tadav Alav, Vayishmuel Av Bnei Israel, Vayasu Kasher Tziva Adonai Moshe. Moshe passed away at the age of 120 years, but he was still vigorous, and Bnei Israel cried and mourned him. And then Bnei Israel listened to Yoshua Binun, who was filled with wisdom because Moshe laid his hands upon him. It was so poignant that I was reading this to my father right before his passing. My father was vigorous like Moshe and was focused on leading a nation to the next level. My father, like Moshe in his time with his generation, was focused on crafting the next generation of the Jewish youth in Israel and America and around the world to love Torah, to love Jews, to love Israel, to be moral and to affect tikkun olam. My father felt that he was creating the next generation of leaders. And just like B'nai Israel, I was crying when the vitality of such a colossal figure in my life was ebbing. And I said, Vidui with him. We are all crying for the loss of my father, even though you could say he's 99, it's his time. But it was not his time because he had so much more to give and was always transmitting that message. I want to say a few words in Hebrew. Like Yotav also spoke in Hebrew, you're always wondering, why are we speaking Hebrew? Because everyone knew his passion for Ivrit Ivrit and his love for the Hebrew language. Whenever alumni would speak to my father, especially the ones from a long time ago, they would always speak to him in Ivrit. And my kids would always marvel, marvel, why are they breaking their teeth speaking to him in Ivrit? They should speak to him in English. You don't speak to Rav Eliach in English. You speak to him in Hebrew. <laughs> so I'm going to speak a little bit to him. La Abba v'Saba Hayakar, Isha Eshkolot, Abba Miuchad Bimino, Netzer Mikarlin Stolin, Lelov Yelid Yerushalayim, Shechdir Banu Ahavat HaTorah, Ha'am Ba'aretz, Abba Ohev, Choshev, Ragish, Umaasi, Lamadnu Torah Biyachad, Tiyalnu Biyachad, Sochachnu Biyachad, Chakarnu Emunot V'Deyot, ביחד, בענייני תרבות ביחד. הישגיך כה רבים, מחייך הנאוצים בירושלים, בקרלין, בחדר, בסמינר בני עקיבא, בישיבת חברו, כמעריץ של הרב קוק והרב הרצוג, הפנמת והפצת את תורת ישראל לעם ישראל וארץ ישראל. רכשת מבט עולם רחב ומגוון, המקשר עולמות. אתה ממייסדי ישיבות בני עקיבא, מורה, מנהל, במוצא, כפר בתיה, איפה שפגשת את אימא. חינכת צברים, עולים, ילדי טהרן, וניצולי שואה, וקישרת אותם למסורת עם ישראל. בנית בית נאמן בישראל עם אימא, יפה, לשם ולתפארת. הגרתם לארצות הברית ויחד העשרתם את הקהילה האמריקאית. במסד, ובמיוחד בישיבת פלאטוש, החלת מהפכה בחינוך היהודי האמריקאי. החדרת ערכים של עמילות בתורה ובלימודים מצוינות והרמת את הכרם של עברית בעברית וחשיבות הפעילות בעד אחינו בית ישראל ותיקון עולם. היית חלוץ בהחדרת מרכזיות חסד בתוכנית הלימודים. 
יישמת תוכנית י"ג, לימוד השנה בארץ, שגרמה מהפכה בקהילה היהודית העולמית, שהעניצה את אהבתם לתורה, לעם ולמדינת ישראל. אתה מחנך המחנכים, לימדת את מחנכי דורנו. ספריך שיצאו לאור בשנים האחרונות מגלים פנים חדשות וישנות, עבר שלא עבר ב-ever present past, מתארים את חייך שחוו מלחמה ושלום, חסידות והעולם הדתי הלאומי, ישראל וגולה, מסד ופלאטוש ועוד. בגיל צד ח' את 98, הוצאת לאור ספר שירה בעברית שורות, my father loved to write poetry. ספר שמגלה לב ונפש, שואל ושואף, ועטוף בארטילי קדושה. אבא, you had a huge impact, it's hard for me to speak about it in the past. You had a huge impact on our lives and on our children's lives, your grandchildren and great-grandchildren. We all learned so much from you, but mostly, We loved spending time with you and feeling that love through your pride in all of us. It was a marvel to see how you connected with each grandfather, each grandchild, through your loving, probing questions. Saba always had questions for everybody, and you had to answer them. And finally, I am privileged to be your daughter. Not many fathers and daughters have the kind of close relationship we had that spans entire lifetime from beginning to end in so many areas. I miss you. We all miss you and feel that enormous loss. Tehei nishmatcha tzura b'tzor chayim. say at the outset we didn't coordinate, but it's not so surprising to coordinate. O dinuvun de seva, de shenim arananim yiyu. Pasuk says in Tehillim, bracha, someone who grows old, reaches advanced age, who continues to be fresh and creative and dynamic, להגיד כי ישר השם צורי ולא אבלו סבא. This itself is a testament to the greatness, to the perfection, and to the deep faith that one has in the Rebbe Shalom. This pasuk, puzzling, enigmatic conclusion of a ubiquitous mizmar, mizmar shil yom ha-shabbos, Very surprising. What is the relationship, the link, between supple, creative, dynamic longevity on the one hand, and a profound faith, a commitment and devotion to the Rabbanu Shalom on the other. And yet, this pasuk typifies, embodies, Bo Rikhami, my father-in-law, Rab Dr. Srav Abid It really goes to the core of who he was. Moshe Rabbeinu's departure as Professor Smadar, Moses Zweig just indicated, from leadership, from the world, the seal of the Torah itself that we just read the other day echoes this very theme. The greatest and most flexible leader of the Jewish people and the one who for all times is the greatest. The Adon HaNaviyim, Moshe Rabbeinu, the Eved Hashem, is depicted in the final words of the Torah alongside the obvious, stunning achievements. Lo kam naviv od Yisrael ki Moshe, asher yidao Hashem panim el panim, l'kol ha'usos v'amoksim, asher sholchu Hashem l'asos b'eret Mitzrayim. But all of this is introduced with the apparently more trivial description 
It's what Dar spoke of. Lo chasa eno lo nas lecho. Focusing on how remarkably Moshe Rabbeinu remained active, robust, fresh, engaged, even in his advancing years. And the question is why? How can these two aspects of Moshe's personality, one seemingly just trivial, physical, just a fact, and the other, of course, going to the core of his spiritual persona, how could they be connected? But of course, Chazal referred to the spiritual contribution that continued to be robust. Lo nistigu mayanosa v'torosa. But as my father-in-law would have remarked, you can't ignore pshuto shel pshad either. Certainly, the Torah also means to say that he was physically engaged, that he was optimistic, that he was supple, that he was creative. But the capacity to remain idealistic and engaged and passionate about the world and its purpose, to be involved and impressed with beauty and poetry, and especially with the endlessly fascinating content and values of Torah itself, hafochba, hafochba de kulaba, is not peripheral or coincidental. The ability to maintain that kind of enthusiasm and focus underscores a clarity of perspective, unflagging faith in and enthusiasm for Torah Hashem, the word of God that inspires, that reflects profound commitment, deep conviction, and deep belief. Moshe Rabbeinu's continued engagement and creativity bespoke his whole personality and his whole career. He was imbued with these rare qualities because these rare qualities are rooted in that perspective. One who advances in years has experienced so much joy and sorrow, adventure, puzzlement. Shlomo Melech, in the Kohelis that we just read, formulates all of the problems. You can become fatigued with life, confused with its purpose, and in some cases you can become, tend to become, jaded, cynical, or simply exhausted with life and the search for meaning. Abel habalim hakol haba. But there are those rare skenim, who are rananim and deshenim, that lonas lecho, that continues to be fascinated by and creative with their understanding because it's rooted in sof davar akol nishma talokim yira et mitzvotav shemor, the recognition kizeh kol ha'adam, the Torah, commitment to Torah, the study of Torah, transmitting Torah, is what is important. These individuals are a special breed, they have special insight and special stature. Lahagid ki yashar Hashem, suri v'loav lasabo. A person who really is the shenin v'rananim at an advanced age is someone who by definition has that sense of clarity and purpose and commitment and that deep belief in the Rebbe This quality of Moshe Rabbeinu lo nas lecho was the key not only to his longevity but to his unsurpassed stature from the very beginning to the end. My father-in-law's stunning attainments in Zikna, many of which were already referred to, reflects his range and especially his relentless passion for Torah and for Abba Sashem. Avar shalo avar, the ever-present past. Zachor yemot olam binu shno stor vador. She wrote the poetry, kitvu lachem esashira hazos, an appreciation that is rare for the aesthetic, for the gnomic, even for the transcendental. Pshuto shal pshat, an endless fascination with Tanakh, with Ivrit, with Parshanut, as Madar said, in his own particular way. The mentoring of teachers in methodology here at Yeshiva Flatbush, all of these drew upon his earliest experiences and interests. Karlin Chasidut, the years in Yeshiva Hebron, leadership in the movement of B'nai Akiva, but they also are reflected the culmination 
of a life of achievement and education anchored in deep emuna and avas Torah, indeed, avas Hashem. The ability to harness his varied background in an ever-changing, supple, creative way in Chinuch made him simply the Machane Chador in terms of methodology and guidance in teaching. He was both Pleitat Sofrehem, as our Soloveitchik Zechorn Lebracha said about his Rebbe or Chaim Heller in a Hesped, an individual who experienced the Gedolin and the values of the previous generation, who bridged them, transmitted them, but also reformulated them when it was appropriate. Avar Shalom Avar, from one era to another. Anybody who saw the recently published piece in Ami magazine, where he speaks about his experiences with yesterday's Gedolin, knows what I mean. But also the most innovative and restless educator of our time. Tachnit Yud Gimel, that pioneering program which revolutionized the trajectory of diaspora Jewry, that Rav Yotav referred to, Ivrit the Ivrit, the many other innovations that were applied here in Yeshiva of Flatbush and from that laboratory to the rest of the Chinook world, as Rabbi Eliyach would recall with great pride and with great satisfaction. All of these revolutionized the, trans, the trajectory of diaspora Jewry in a very big way. And simply, the endless wellspring of projects and ideas, how to teach ancient, profound, immutable values in a changing world, was something to behold. Baruch HaMakom Baruch Hu, Kenegen Arba Banim Dibra Torah, from Chaim Soloveitchik, famously explained, refers to the remarkable capacity of Torah itself to be relevant to all levels. How can the same text be relevant and be a foundation for a Chacham, for a Rasha, for a Tam and an Enio Deo It's not a human text, it's supernatural. But one might add that Mori Chami was remarkable in his capacity to provide didactic guidance to teaching at all levels and in a wide range of social and cultural milieu. Yeshivot B'nai Akiva, Meshek Dimotza, Farbatya, of course, especially his signature contribution, the Yeshiva Flapush, which he molded and in which he stamped his imprint, how to teach Gemara, how to inculcate Chesed, Ivrit the Ivrit, Avas Yisrael, Avas Eretz Yisrael, a kolel for teachers in the school, guidance to teachers on every level, the elementary and the high school, his impactful classes in Israeli graduate school, his methodological supervision of the Avrechim of a kolel. We in the kolel, Yonah the Vishiva Sarbeni Yitzvachanan, had this chus two years ago, right before COVID, of an insightful lecture, how to teach Tanakh as a source of emunah in the modern era at the age of 96. This range that remained rooted in single-minded conviction about the unsurpassed importance of Jewish education, chinuch, Torah learning, as the key to Jewish identity, the cultivation of transcendent values, characterized his whole remarkable career and suffused his very persona. As a father, a grandfather, a father-in-law, he remained integrated along with being a loving and fascinating grandfather, what I referred to before. He remained the mechanic par excellence, always probing, <laughs> always assessing, always engaged though, always interested in what everybody was thinking and learning, how and why, always offering a little bikoret or a lot of bikoret strong opinions, penetrating insights, never satisfied with facile answers or generalities, lo nas lecho, the shein in the Our children, his grandchildren, benefited tremendously from this interest and passion, as well as his creativity. It produced a special and unforgettable bond. As a son-in-law, I enjoyed a special bond suffused with great mutual affection, for sure, but also very much anchored in 
our mutual passion in Chinuch and Tov. He attended my Gemara Shir in Fifth Avenue Synagogue, I think for about 15 years. With great humility, from somebody of that age, attending the Shir of a much younger teacher, but also as an active and challenging participant for whom the Mulchanta Shul Torah was a source of tremendous joy and education. I appreciated his involvement, as did the other members of the Shir, tremendously. And we missed it profoundly when he was no longer able to attend. It's surely no coincidence, as I mentioned before, that Rabbi Yotav, that Professor Smadar, Rosenzweig, that Rabbi Tzion, that many of the grandchildren already have followed him and my unforgettable mother-in-law, Professor Yafa Eliach, Aleha HaShalom, his full partner in Chinuch, in the areas of administration, education, and rabbinus. And those who didn't as a vocation are fully suffused with that enthusiasm as an avocation. In the end, he's best described simply as an Ohe Hashem. In the way that the Rambam depicts it in Sefer Mitzvos, when he speaks about Abraham Avinu as Abraham Ohavi, someone whose love for Torah was so overflowing and exuberant that he was irrepressible in his need to share and to impact upon others. Such was the overflowing joy and passion for Chinuch that characterized and unified my father-in-law's diverse life as the Gadol HaMechanchim of our time. That overriding, profound reality in his life was crystallized in his capacity to keep marching forward with conviction and with creativity. The Shainim Viranami. Bila HaMaves Lanetza Kumasha Hashem Maka Hashem Elokim Dima Yal Kapanim Yehi Sifro Baruch. Now we'd like to call for Divrei Hesped Rabbi Dr. Raymond Harari, protege of his, he began their association as a youth, as a Talmud. I know he took tremendous pride in Rabbi Harari's accomplishments, his assuming the post of leadership in Flatbush, Rosh Hashiva. He recently shared with me the Dvar Torah that he was going to give at some milestone celebration for Rabbi Harari. It's so obvious that that's a special bond and connection. After that, Mr. A.B. Hinnery, President of Yeshiva Flatbush, will speak for a couple of moments, and I believe introduce Mr. Steve Aylesberg, who was also a decades-long student and somebody whose bond with my father-in-law was really belave ubenefesh, sense of devotion and deep bond, which the family deeply appreciates, which my father-in-law really treasured. name and his being has been synonymous with the yeshiva of Flatbush for decades, and for good reason. He lived in the yeshiva and for the yeshiva. He directed the educational program at the yeshiva in its very formative and sometimes turbulent years. He represented ideologically the mission of the yeshiva to inculcate in our students excellence in Judaic and secular studies, deep passion for Medinat Yisrael and Eretz Yisrael, and a Torah and Judaism that emphasized the primacy of chesed and outreach. I came to know Rabbi Eliach when I was a high school student some years ago. We were, to say the least, in awe of him. His strength, his firmness, and his singular dedication to the school. <clears throat> in my senior year, we were fortunate to have Rabbi Eliach teach our class, our Humash class. We had never really learned Humash in the creative way that he did. 
with the Pshat orientation, which has been spoken about, one which he cultivated and was writing about until his last days. And then, during that senior year, Rabbi Eliach took ill. The doctors struggled to figure out what had stricken him, only much later to attribute the illness that it had him home for weeks and for months to a disease generated by mold in his office. Significantly, and this is the point, even when he was ill and he was bedridden, he used to prepare tapes for us, his students, and send them and have a monitor, make sure that we were learning even when he was away. This was not the first or last time that Rabbi Eliach exemplified for me and for countless others an uncanny work ethic, nourished by his love of Torah and his dedication to share it with his students. Over the years, Rabbi Eliach taught us that even if one student showed up to class, he or she deserved to be taught. He taught by example, as he always did, that a mental health day is spent in the yeshiva teaching and interacting with students. When I began teaching at the yeshiva, I got to appreciate Rabbi Eliyach as a master pedagogue. For him, it was unconscionable for a teacher to come unprepared to class or not to have worked out lesson plans beforehand. Unconscionable. He couldn't understand it. A lesson had to be motivational, engaging, mapped out on the board, and contain a beginning, a middle, an end. His core belief was that the lesson had to be relevant to the students. But for him, that didn't mean to dumb down the lesson, has shalom. He wouldn't even understand what I was talking about. But rather to meet the students where they were and elevate them in accordance with their capacity. Rabbi Eliach was courageous and he was direct. In those ways, he taught many of us to aspire to be great teachers. He was not afraid to point out the weaknesses of a lesson or of a program. But at the same time, he lavished praise when it was appropriate. In about my fifth or sixth year of teaching here in the yeshiva, I remember Rabbi Eliach brought five six or six teachers to observe my Jewish history lesson about the revolt of Bar Kokhba. I was, to say the least, anxious. Afterwards, in his unique manner, he analyzed the lesson with the teachers and with me, and then at the end, he concluded, uncharacteristically, I have nothing to add. <laughs> that was a first for me. No greater compliment could be had. For Rabbi Eliyach, that modesty was natural. For me, I cherished that compliment for years and remember it until today. His office was always open. He was always available to talk. You could just march in on him in ways that was sometimes a little crazy. He was open to new, to veteran teachers, to students of all, all types, and to alumni as well. Often, he would listen in a meeting for about 15 to 20 minutes, say nothing, and then in one or two sentences, he would clinch the essence of what had been said. He had a clear, unclogged mind. For Rabbi Eliach, the most profound thoughts had to be understood and expressed simply. His passion for Ivrit was legendary. I remember a conversation we had about 40 years ago. It was downstairs in the sub-basement. When I lapsed into English in one of my lessons, Has Shalom, he told me in the and only the way that Rabbi Aliyah could say this, that some Mahazorim for the Yamim Noraim dictated that the Hazan kan sirchim livkot. It is at this point you have to cry. Rabbi Aliyah repurposed that comment and he changed it and he applied it to me and he said, kan sirchim litzok. Loosely translated, having heard you speak in English here, I must protest. That one comment showcased the depth of his commitment to Ivrit and professionalism. He could not understand, could not understand that a teacher would take the liberty of not showing up to class on a particular day. He couldn't understand that a teacher 
would violate the contract that they had with the yeshiva to speak the Ivrit. He just couldn't understand it. It exemplified his yoke of responsibility for what happens in the yeshiva and his desire to deliver a message, in this case to me, that was digestible and palpable without being threatening. Of course, his love of Ivrit was matched by his love of Israel, his insistence on confronting and learning from the Shoah and from all of world events, his openness to bringing into the school even controversial speakers to speak to the student body, and of course, his love of sharing Divrei Torah publicly and privately. Rabbi Eliach's impact was and is far greater than what he had on his students during his time period. His values, his penetrating comments on how to teach a sugya, his menschlachkai, a word that he loved to use, his efficiency, and most of all, his dedication to Jewish education can still be felt in our yeshiva in all realms. When I came to the school just a few weeks ago, at the beginning of the school year, I was assigned a new office on the basement level. There were two names on the door, mine, and above it, Rabbi Aliyah's name, slightly above. I could not be happier to have a constant reminder when I go into my office of what I should aspire to. trustees, our body, the alumni of Yeshiva Flapush, like to offer condolences to Rabbi Eliyah Satel's family. As a uh, graduate and as a parent, a board member, and now the president of the Yeshiva, I, like the thousands of graduates of the Yeshiva, owe so much to Rabbi Eliyah. After learning of developing a love of Torah, love of Eretz Israel as a student. I went on to study in Israel, and I attended Yeshiva University, neither of which I would have done without the influence and the path set by Rabbi Eliyah. It was the Rabbi's love, his caring demeanor, his warmth, his patience, um, his vision, and his wisdom that was a model for our teachers, for our administrators, and as was said, spread to schools in Shivot all over the country, and indeed all over the world, including at Israel. I'd like to ask Mr. Steve Edelsberg to come say a few words. Steve is a trustee of the Yeshiva, president 2000 to 2004, and remained very close with Rabbi Adam. <coughs> of our Karogna Nothing happens by accident. So, in Smadar, Rabbi Oda, by the old, two days ago, in Simchas Torah, we saw the parallel, by the way. Vayam Hashem Moshe Eber Hashem Elo Yada Isha Kuburata Ad Hayom Hazer Elo Chei Hasa Einav Elo Nas Leicha his eye did not diminish, his vigor did not, did not, his eye did not dim, his vigor did not diminish. We always have to put some humor, Rabbi Eliyah, because he would probably say yes. And I survived 25 honorary presidents. <laughs> no small feat. I believe you could say I'm no pun. He survived the unguished little flapper. He was a survivor. I first met Rav Eliyach in Machane Masar. I was eight, Yotav was four. I believe, Swandar, you weren't a thought, but you were there. In Machane Masad, everyone's called by their first name. The head of the camp, 
was Shlomo Shosegar. You called him Shlomo. The Rav Machane was Harav Chavet Selet. You called him Meir. There was a Hiram Machon. His name was Amno. Later on, I learned that was Rabbi Haramaki. His wife, there was no Mrs. Haramaki, it was Dina. But there was only Rabbi Eliach. My memory of Rabbi Eliach, the vision, not changed from 1960 to 2022. He called me just two months ago, on the eve of his 99th birthday, and he said, Steve, I think I have to retire. <laughs> well, Rabbi, I think we could stop the guests. Uh, you don't have to take the accessor ride anymore to school. We stopped that uh, only 20 years ago. It started our relationship, and it's so true. He's not selling the talk to English. It's that simple. But that was okay. A principal of Yeshiva Fabish went to be interviewed with another Yeshiva. They had three questions for this principal. Three very interesting questions. It really deserves to be said at the Hesper of Harav Eliach. The first question, can you really get kids to talk their shirts in? <laughs> Second question, can you really give a grade level final? And the third question, can you really teach it writ bit of writ? And all the questions were yes. If you have that, we all waited for Yom Ha'atzmaut. In Yom Ha'atzmaut, we read Tefillat Aravit Hagigi. Never heard that before. And everyone who was here from the Gal, who was here in the Galut, who was here in Eretz Israel, came to the Yeshiva of Flatbush to hear her Eliach. Because when he closed his up, when you closed your eyes. He transformed you to the bush. So that year in yeshiva, the base of that bush. You close your eyes, and he took you. You went to a funeral. Funeral. You went to a chasana, a wedding. And there you were. You saw Rabbi Eliach, and you were excited because you knew he was going to read the kasuba. And you read it to Shir Hashir. So I went to ask them, how'd you come up to this? Because by the time you were singing it, all the black cats were ready to throw you, I had to carry you out, but it was too late already. But how'd you come up with this? And he said, I was bored. So let me spice it up a little. When he read the Kasuba, the woman here could tell you, sure. Now, one woman's mascara didn't run, didn't cry. Because the chuppah, you look up, and the shemayim would open up, from the words of Rabbi Eliyach. 21 presidents he worked with. We all had the same advantage. We didn't have to give him advice. We just had to keep the parent body away from him. <laughs> because if he did his decisions, the Chanech, Hanar, Api, Darko, and everyone had a different understanding of words. Everyone had a different derech. He would teach, Rabbi Prague would tell me that when a student was leaving yeshiva, because it wasn't for him, but he had to pass his courses, Rabbi Eliyahu would teach Rabbi Prague, make it easy for him. Let him leave with a good feeling on himself. And yet, someone like Rabbi Harari would come up to him and say, and talk English, he would give him a look. No, no, no. Nothing about that. I was, over the years, I was privileged. He was so accessible, so easy. Call on a Friday afternoon. 
How many of us here have a voice message that we're not going to erase? The Vatara, but more importantly, the song. We would share the Yeshiva Father together, but together we would jump into the world of Hasidus. I would go to the Hasidus of beyond, and he would go to the Hasidus of Stona and rest me. So, how is your Rebbe? And please tell him about me. And I would say, Harav, Ukvayudea, Alecha, Vakoma Asecha. It's more than true that we say from Yeshiva Fabush that he started Shnat Yad Gimel. He goes to Ravina from Rosh Hashiva to Meir, and Rosh Hashiva to Aryeh. He will tell you, there's no question about it. The Shnat Yad Gimel that is now going on in, the, in Eretz Yisrael, that every Yeshiva is there, was his idea. No et son is a buts about it. It was him and Rabbi Tadelbaum from Ovishon from YCQ. This was their machshav, this was their doing. Very quietly. Everything was very quietly. How do I conclude with one story? In 1986, Steve Shannon was the president. We were having a meeting, a post dinner meeting. It's a nice idea. But we sat down, and Steve remembers this. We sat down. We had people from the dinner sitting around the table discussing things we could do better, things we could do much better. <laughs> and an old timer, an old trustee, an old honorary president, raises his hand. The year's 1987, 1986. And he asked a very simple question. Who decided that we no longer have mixed dancing at the Yeshiva Fakush dinners? You know, it's one of those questions that becomes all of a sudden there's, a, there's an elephant in the room and there's a silence. And of course, Rav Eliach puts his head up. And he says very simply, In Olim B'Kedusha, Lo Yardim B'Kedusha. Once you go up, you don't come down. And that to me, my relationship with Rav Eliach, was always your Ola B'Kedusha. Do something better. <laughs> Be there for people. Be a good friend, but really, do the work. I have lost, Renee and I have lost a mentor, a friend, the Mishihu Shaniti Nisokhech Be'ivrit. When you met a Bagrei Yeshiv Tafapish, Akshav Shahib Be'erich Yisrael, and I'm not sure if you're the Neshama Shal Rabbeinu. We'll conclude the Divrei Hesved with the words of two of the grandchildren. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, Rav Eliach was deeply involved, engaged, and very proud of all of his grandchildren. You know, it sounds like a cliche, but it's really true. And uh, he really knew each one, valued each one for who they were. Kanoch and Arpidarka. So it's fitting, certainly, that we conclude the Divrei Hesped with words from um, Liam Eliach, representing the Eliach side of the family, and then Rab Itamar Rosenzweig, representing the Rosenzweig. After that, Rabbi Joseph Deda, who was the head of school, and he told me before how he came here as, a, again, a close Talmud of my father-in-law from his time teaching Abrechim in the Kolel, uh, Legra Franco. Uh, we'll make a few announcements, and that will be followed by Kel Mali Rachanin, by another protege, another very deeply close Talmud, Rabbi Ronald Levy, who will say to call it Kel Mali Rachanin. sitting next to Sado and Shul, and Davening had just ended, and the rabbi was giving his us usual post-Davening drasha. 
Sabo was listening intently, as he usually does with his hands around his ear, like this in the first row. And he, he turns to me after the speech, but instead of the usual, Liam, lo shamati af mila, mahu amar. Liam, I didn't hear one word. What did he say? He said the following. Liam, lo shamati af mila. Uh, Liam, I didn't hear one word, but you know what I would do with the speech? Very curious about what he could possibly do with the speech he didn't actually hear. I said, Ma Saba, Ma What Saba, what would you do? He replied with a huge smirk, which turned into a laugh. Haiti Mekatser, Harbe. I would make it shorter, a lot shorter. So I think this is what he would have wanted. If there's anything I learned from public speaking from Saba, it's to start with a joke, capture an idea or two, and make it short and to the point. To me, Saba was a grandfather and a grand storyteller. He was a storyteller extraordinaire. Saba had a story for everything, from growing up in Yerushalayim, his unique cheder experience, the Kvarbatya, Masad stories, teaching at Flappish for countless decades, to Bnei Akiva, and of course my favorite, his travel stories. I knew I mastered Saba's travel stories when he would turn to me before telling his story and say, Nu, Liam, what's the name of the place near South America with the wind? He said, uh, Aruba Saba. Not sure if Aruba, not sure if Aruba is known for its wind, but it played a pr crucial role in Saba's Aruba travel story. <laughs> Saba lived a full and vibrant life. He had so many dimensions to him. He created a masterpiece out of life, and it always came through his stories. I was always excited for Saba to come over for Shabbos and Yantan because it meant I would get to hear Saba's stories, even if it wasn't the first, or even the second, or the third time. What was so powerful about Saba's storytelling was how immersive the experience was. I felt like I was there. I especially loved hearing his stories about his Hasidic past in Yerushalayim. When he had described how he would flood the Karlina Shul on Shri Shal Pesach, the last day of Pesach, to Mimek Kriya Shal Yamsuf, the spilling of the sea. I felt like I could almost feel the water on my feet. I think that's why my parting words to Saba within the hour of his passing. Was the Karlina big? So, if only a couple of years ago at, Shabbat, at the Shabbos table, Saba was tearing up the cough. So, as the whole family sang the Zemer. And that was me barely getting to the words. As they watched. They want so peacefully enter the Naga Yotzamed. It was a very powerful moment seeing, singing Kaisof to Saba. It was a perfect way to say goodbye to our Saba. When I immerse myself in the Tfilos of the Yamim Narayim, I find myself moved by the beauty and the richness of the Hebrew language that we employ throughout our tefillos. Whether it's the exquisite description of the Divine Academy administering justice during the Sanatoka, or the vivid depiction of the Kohen Gadol in the courtyard of the Beis HaMikdash, or just the versatility of the words, or the measured meter of the verse, the Hebrew language has a special power to move us. Throughout our tefillos, we draw attention, we emphasize, the exceptional character of the language we employ. The Shliach Tibor in Ochil Alael, he exclaims, La What can a man do but arrange his emotions? But Me Hashem Man El Hashem. Eloquent speech is a godly gift. And before every Chazar Sashat on the Yom Narayim, the Shliach Tibor begins, Misod Chachamim Munivonim, Umilemet Das Nevinim. That the language he employs, the Hebrew language he employs throughout the Tila, is a secret passed down from our wise men and scholars and derived from our ancient tradition of Jewish women. Saba not only breathed life and special meaning into these words as our Shliach Tzibor and Yamin Orayim, which he led cloaked in his talis with great boys here at the Yeshiva of Bafash, but throughout the year to converse with Saba was to engage with the elegance and power of the Hebrew language in its full splendor as a sowed chacham munivonim and a lemed das nevinim, a language passed down from our wise men and scholars and derived from our ancient tradition of learning. Any conversation with Saba was peppered with Tanakh, 
Mishnah, Agada, plays on Hebrew words and Hebrew poetry. In Saba, the eloquence of the Hebrew language came alive. For as long as I can remember, an Arab shop is hardly passed in the Rosenzweig house, where Saba's voice wasn't heard over the speakerphone, reading to Ima the latest poetry that he composed, exploring in his beautiful Hebrew verse themes that touched his mind and soul. At the time, I would have said that Saba was reading Shira, but now we know that he was reading Shura. Few people on this side of the Atlantic appreciated the Hebrew language and its Masora as Saba did. No one did more to ensure that American Jewry would be literate, if not conversant in its true language, than Saba did. Saba pioneered the Abrikri Brit movement in Jewish day schools, and he held his family to the same exacting standards, insisting on speaking to us only in Hebrew. When I was a young child, maybe a few days into my first grade, Saba pulled me aside and asked, Itamar, atamivini brit? I knew just enough Hebrew at the time to answer low <laughs> and to get the gist of the phrase that he uttered to my parents. Ilu shalachtem otoli yeshiva de flakosh, hu hayam ivrit. Saba was extremely proud of his Ivrit Ivrit initiative. He would tell the story that upon visiting Israel, after he had moved to the United States, he met Nechama Leibowitz at some conference, and she said to him in his recounting, David, what are you doing in Chutzlar as you belong here with us in Eretz Yisrael? Saba related to her his story that before he came to the United States, he asked Rav Herzog what should he do. Rav Herzog told him, better to go to America and think all the time about Eretz Yisrael than to stay in Eretz Yisrael and always think about America. Nechama Leibowitz didn't buy the justification, but she said, David, I hear that you instituted Ibrit Ibrit in America. That's a partial consolation. I don't think Saba needed a consolation, and he certainly didn't need a partial consolation. Saba was super proud of what he accomplished here in the United States. I remember sitting with him on his balcony overlooking the East River, and I asked Saba if he had any regrets about coming to America. And without batting an eyelash and looking at me with his clear blue eyes, he said, I would not have accomplished everything that I was able to accomplish here had I stayed in Israel. I suppose, as the Rambam does in Marnebuchim, that part of mastering a language is knowing when not to employ it. I went with Saba about nine years ago to Israel on a trip, just the two of us, and we were in Tveria and Saba was feeling uh, slightly ill. And Saba was of the opinion at the time that if you wanted adequate health care in Israel, you had to present yourself as an American. <laughs> so we went to the doctor, and Saba, in his heavily accented Yushami English, <laughs> begins to explain to the doctor in broken English, what his ailment was. In the middle, he turned to me and said, uh, Itamar, <laughs> The doctor, of course, had a degree from Berkeley, and I think he gave Saba excellent medical care, despite the fact that he wasn't fooled by the charade. I don't want to give the impression that Saba was a Hebraist, interested in the language for its own sake. Far from it. For Saba, mastery of the Hebrew language was the only legitimate entry point to our Masora of learning. It was the key, if you will, to the sod of our Chachamim and Nebonim, and to the Lemet Das Medina. The Biatama Chacham Saba thought one needed to directly encounter our Torah's teachings. Lo Aide Malach, not through a translation. Lo Aide Shliach, not through an intermediary, but through the Lashon HaKodesh Bechvod of Ra'atma. This conviction undergirded Saba's indefatigable pursuit of the Pshuta Shapshat. He would inquire of us, maybe he would demand, what precisely does the Nesatika Elyon mean? What is conveyed by the concept of Segula? What is the meaning of Kilo Shalem Avon Amori? Saba loved to learn and to think, and his inquisitive mind never rested. For years, he and Safta would host and run a Friday night learning group at their home in Flatbush. Saba was also one of the most lively participants, as Abba mentioned, in Abba's Gemara Ian Shir at the Fifth Avenue. And as Saba's Chaveirim could attest, it was certainly a lively group. group. Saba had a daily Chavrusa well into his 90s with his brother, Dod Chaim. And I don't think a day went by where Saba didn't call Iman to get her input and her thoughts on some idea, Bar Torah, or Chiddush that he was working on. If you dropped into Saba's apartment without advance warning, as I like to do as I took the train from Washington Heights to Queens, you'd find him at work with a yellow pad and either an open Gemara a Mishnah 
or several Tanakhs open at the same time, or maybe even a Kuzari, or Shire Rabbi Huda Levi, or a Messias Yisharim. His ever-curious mind was hard at work. When I would call Stav on the phone, he would open the discussion by declaring in the recent years, Oh, Hanaka mi Philadelphia, Saper li eza chidush. One time, Stav asked me what was going on in Yeshiva, and I told him that one of the Hebronis, one of the Rosh Yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael, had come to YU to deliver a shir. Stav got very excited, and he said, Oh, Harab Hebroni, ani zocher tashirim shal asava shalom. And on the spot, Saba said, I remember how he used to organize his shir. Many questions up front and one big answer. And that's exactly how the grandson's shir proceeded. I would try to call Saba on Erev Shabbos. The problem was that it was impossible to pick up the phone with Saba without blocking out at least an hour for the conversation. <laughs> Since Saba could converse, and he loved to converse about so many things, Torah, Machshava, politics, Maiselach, Yerushalayim, Shayagnon, the foliage and the Poknos, Kalin and Dibunim, the Chazanish and the Chalim and Yeshiva. Saba treated us all as Chavrusas, with all the sense of camaraderie and kinship that the word implies. Hanging up the phone before Shabbos, I would sometimes feel such a strong bond with Saba that I was convinced that the meaning of the untranslatable phrase, Minasho, Shur, Minasho, was true of us. I mentioned that Saab was our Shriach Tzibor here at the Yeshiva of Flatbush on the Yom Yimno Ryan. Saab was a quintessential Shriach Tzibor, separate from being the Baltfila. Like the Chazanite Kol Nidre, who declares that he represents the entire Kahal, even the Avar Yanin, Saab was a true Shriach Tzibor, a trustee, if you will, of the entire Tzibor, in all its diversity. He treated each member of this Tzibor with equal solemnity and respect, and the diversity of his Talmidim, in, which, in whom he took so much pride, attests to this point. In many ways, Saba, a Karliner Chassid, a disciple of Lithuanian yeshivo, a product of the Musar movement, a shtikl maskil, maybe more than a shtikl, and a passionate Zionist Mizrachinik, transcended many of the social divisions that might appear relevant to others. I once delivered a shear in Englewood, and one of the attendees came because she heard that I was a grandson of Rabbi Eliyaf. She told me that she couldn't believe her ears that Rabbi Eliyaf's grandson read Hebrew, the Havara Ashkenazis. The truth is that Saba himself would daven the Havara Ashkenazis, because that was his upbringing in the Karliner Kader. But when he would lane the Haftorah, which he learned after he transferred to a Mizrahi school, he would lane the Havara Sparadi. The tefillos of the Yom Noraim have just concluded, and our great Shliach Zibor has departed along with them. Yet he is once again cloaked in his talus, ready to lead his Zibor. And even if we don't hear his voice of al-Mahadim in this world, he continues to daven for us and to lead us there in the al -Madazi. One of the many simple yet profound lessons that Rabbi Eliyah taught in word, but more so in deed, is Loha Midrash HaYikar El HaMaaseh. As much was said about his scholarship and his love for learning, for him it had to translate into something that was meaningful, that was impactful, that was active, that was action. Go make the world happen. Go make something happen. Go do a mitzvah. We've been here reflecting about him, thinking about him, and all the greatness that he was, is, and represents. And we have the opportunity to do a mitzvah, and that is the Lavot Hamet. After the El Malera Hamim, which will be delivered by Rabbi Levi, we're going to exit the auditorium through the exit in the back, my left where the hearse is waiting, and we're going to perform the mitzvah of Levaya and escort the rabbi down the block. I'm going to ask everyone in the auditorium to please leave first, and then the 670-plus students in our building will follow us right afterwards. 
So please join us on the street. Students, after we escort the hearse down the block, you're dismissed for the day. However, I invite all students and all participants today to join us for Tehillim and learning of Mishnayot in our newly built Bet Midrash uh, immediately after escorting the hearse for the Levaya. Rabbi